This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. Kevin Roberts has been CEO worldwide of Saatchi & Saatchi since 1997 and in the space of 11 years has cemented the ad agency's reputation as one of the most successful and creative companies in the industry. Among Saatchi & Saatchi's clients are Procter & Gamble, General Mills, Novartis, Toyota, J.C. Penney, and the New York State Department of Economic Development. Roberts, who travels the world with a New York-based company, is perhaps most well-known for an idea he came up with called Love Marks, which means creating a brand for which the consumer has, quote, loyalty beyond reason, end quote. Before joining Saatchi and Saatchi, Roberts worked for Mary Quant Cosmetics, Gillette, Procter & Gamble, and Pepsi-Cola. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us, tell us a little bit more about your love mark idea and why it's been such a hit? I started about eight, nine years ago when I was growing very concerned that mass marketing and commodification was going to put companies like mine out of business. I thought brands were getting strangled by assistant brand managers and by promotion budgets and by retailers. So I started to think about what was the future beyond brands. Um, And I had a conversation with a guy called Alan Weber, who at the time was the editor of Fast Company, when Fast Company was very hot. And Alan said, well, it's time we did have some new thinking on brands. What do you got? And I said, well, I think it's all about trust. And you may recall the literature was very based on respect and trust about a decade ago. And he said, that's not very exciting, and it's not very Fast Company. It's kind of business weeky, but, you know, we really want to be on the leading edge, not behind it. Go away and think again. So I went home pretty disconsolate, you know, despondent. When you're in the ideas business and people stomp on your ideas, it's not a great night. So I went home and I live in Tribeca in New York and uh, my wife's in New Zealand. They're kind of a long way apart. So I was there unloved. My wife wasn't there. Alan didn't like my idea. So I opened a couple of bottles of red wine and was doodling around as you do at 2.30 in the morning. And instead of trust marks, I started to draw a little heart. Okay. And I saw heart and marks and then love marks. I thought, man, I got it. This is so simple. What's the deepest emotion of all? So I went to bed, 8.30 in the morning, passed the 8.30 test, called up Alan, said, man, you got to come back. He wrote a cover story about three weeks later on Love Marks and that how it was born. It was then tested. We proved it. We researched it. We figured it. We kind of backfilled all the data into the concept which wouldn't, you wouldn't do at Knowledge Wharton, but it's what we did. And we found out that, yes, indeed, there was an incredible yearning for an emotional connection from consumers. And about that time, a lot of the thinking moved to emotional marketing. So Love Marks was born really out of desperation and fear. All right. You have said in the past that one of the most successful examples of this is Michael Jordan when Nike hired him. Huh for their company. People just absolutely established this incredible emotional connection with him. Somehow the company was able to start selling $70 shoes for $200. He was a phenomenal success, but then he retired. What happens when your love mark brand or your love mark representative retires or goes into drug rehab or whatever? How do you you keep that momentum up? Uh, you, you've got to be authentic, right? And I think Nike had a very authentic position in, you know, they'd come from, they started life as a product, which was very innovative when Barman introduced that at the University of Oregon. It was a waffle sole shoe that had a benefit and attribute, and it was lighter. So it actually helped you run, you know, perform better. Faster, right. So it started life classically as a product. Then when Phil Knight really got his uh, juices flowing, he turned it into a, a massively successful brand with all the brand iconography that we're all familiar with, the swoosh, the just do it idea, the kind of advertising approach that they took. It took Jordan to move Nike from being, if you like, irreplaceable to becoming irresistible because Jordan gave it aspiration. He gave it emotional connectivity. And the whole idea was, you know, if you wear Nikes, you can be like Mike which was a very aspirational thing for many people. That's how the love mark started for Nike. And of course, Nike, the only purpose to create a love mark is to charge a premium. Brands were invented to charge premiums. The premium went out of brands. You had to move into love marks. 
Jordan went from $70 sneakers, as you said, to selling $200 um, Air Jordans. Then what happened, two things. Jordan retired and the sweatshop crisis right. got really Bad a rep. big public right. airing, right? It's very hard to love a company or a brand that is seen to be or perceived to be exploiting other humans, right? Right. Because, you know, that's a really tough thing. Knight and the company then took a look at that and said, whoa, you know, we got to go back to our roots. So what did Nike do? They went more and more local. They sponsor every local college team, every local soccer team, every local athlete. They continued with their heroes, Lance Armstrong and, mm -hmm. uh, and co. But they moved right back into local grassroots. They also addressed their sweatshop right. issue by A, coming clean and B, fixing it. So love is something, as it is in real life, that you can win and you can lose. Mm -hmm. It's certainly something you've got to earn every day and you right. can't take it for granted. You've really got to get deep into the grassroots of your consumer. Love marks are different to brands in one other key, key way, I think, really. Brands are owned by brand managers and by companies, okay? And the biggest problem in business today is persuading companies to give up control mm -hmm. because we've seen power shift. You know, when I grew up, brands had the power. When mm -hmm. I was at Gillette or Procter & Gamble, man, you know, when I walked into a store with Tide or Crest. You were the king, right? I was the king, okay? And then we saw the, uh, the rise and rise of Walmart, you know, the world's biggest company, and we saw private label, and we saw Aldi, and we saw all the price guys, and we saw Tesco in the UK, Carrefour in France, and we saw power switch from brands to retailers. Mm -hmm. That power has now gone forever. Walmart has as little power, as you can see from recent events, as Procter & Gamble, as little or as much. Now power has switched to the consumer. The consumer is boss. And the consumer really will not be talked to or controlled. She's in control. So what we have to do is to give up control. Nike had a hard time doing that, had a hard time doing that. Now they've been able to do it. They've been able to welcome the bloggers. They've been able to welcome the interactivity. So people are falling in love again. What companies besides Nike have been able to establish this connection, kind of to move beyond that? that yeah. Brand? Love marks are very personal, right? So they're mm -hmm. personal to me and to you. I mean, the brands I love may not be the brands that you love. But, I mean, Steve Jobs at Apple would be a classic example. I mean, you can buy any MP3 player in the world that is cheaper than an iPod you know, kind of the batteries will work. Mm -hmm. It won't give you as much frustration. And you wouldn't dream of doing that, right. right? Because you're in love with the iPod. It's got a 75 share. It's trebled the profits of the company. And it's allowed him to restage the music industry, right? Because right. iPods, there are three things that we think make a love mark. They are mystery, sensuality, and intimacy, Words that are never used on your MBA program, okay? <laughs> and these yeah, yeah. words are at the heart of today's consumer choice. And, you know, Unilever don't use them very much, but you can see with Dove that they are starting to understand that intimacy. P&G on Pampers are starting to understand the whole sensuality area. Even on Tide, they've now got smell and all this kind of stuff really deep into the brand. Mm -hmm. So it's those three words. And, and Apple really really drip with that. Toyota has had a recent uh, ad campaign on YouTube that was actually the creative people were from Saatchi and Saatchi LA, I believe. Uh, <coughs> what does that say about how, how big companies are now using social uh, networking sites to promote their products? And is this going to kind of change the way that, that you work with companies? The consumer's boss, so we shouldn't really be thinking about companies anymore okay. or brands anymore. You're spot on. So companies like mine have got to recalibrate away from being brand-centric or company-centric or client-centric or service-centric and be consumer-centric. Yoshi Ishizaka, who ran Toyota for a decade, said to me 10 years ago, Kevin, you will never know more about cars than Toyota. And we will never know more about the people who buy them than Saatchi and Saatchi. Our companies like us now have got to become very, very close to consumers. That's complex because every consumer is different. So the whole mass reach and scale thing has gone. It's complex because information and knowledge are now pure and simple table stakes. 
you will send you know the MBAs out of here. They'll be fully equipped with information. They'll be very knowledgeable how to use it. You know, Harvard will do the same. Stanford will do the same. Not as well as you guys, but they will, in all their own their little way, focus very hard on information and knowledge. What will win in our world is using those vital table stakes quickly, but then developing insight and foresight. Now, you can't get insight and foresight from data and from analysis. Okay, you've got to get it. You know, if you want to know a hell of a lot about lions, you better go to the jungle, not to the zoo. So you've got to figure out how you can empathetically now have the insight into a consumer behavior and then have the creative foresight to do something about that before the competition. Jobs and his folks are very empathetic. I remember you also said recently that uh, while other people are saying that, that that television and newspapers are dead, that actually the television is the most important medium and will be the most important medium for the next 20 years because, A, people have them, including it, com- people abroad, and, B, people know how to use them. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> you, important. And yeah. You've also yeah. said that stores are the second most important medium, the actual going into stores, shopping experience, as opposed to online shopping. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, I, I, I feel that we live, first of all, in the screen age. Right, and I've written a book called Sissimo, which is about sight, sound, and motion. Mm-hmm. None of us now are ever, ever, ever more than a few inches away from a screen because we all carry the mobile phone in our pocket. We all have a computer at work or at home. We all have a five or six TV screens at home. We have our iPod with us. We're constantly in a world of the screen. More and more, that screen will be, as it is in, in many cases already, it will be interactive and it will be social and it will be networked and it will be mobile so the screen is going to be the first place we all go tv will be the absolute dominant screen in the world just look at china look at russia look at india look at brazil look at indonesia and look at the way tvs are absolutely going crazy even in the u.s people still spend two and a half hours a day in front of a television screen and, you know, you're not going to watch a game of football on a three-by-three-inch iPod. You're going to watch it on a 48-inch high-tech, high-digital TV screen, right? The way you watch it will differ because you will want to have control. You will want to be interactive. You will want to be working with the screen. So the screen's vital for all of us. And it's a great communications medium because you can hear it, you can see it, you can touch it, you can interact with it. You should be able to smell it, but you can't yet. But... You can on some sites, you know, you can smell the the smell of a pizza and so on. It drives you crazy. And then in the store, 85% of decisions are made in store. That store can be an online store or it can be a physical store. But that's where the decision making is being made today because we live in a world where pretty much all products are parity, right? All products do as build. Anti-dandruff shampoos, get rid of dandruff. Okay, moisturizers help make your skin soft. Beer tastes good, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's not, the, the differences that there used to be in quality or price are not there anymore. So there's going to be an emotional connection for you that makes you select one shampoo versus another. 85% of the time, that decision takes place in store. In less than three seconds, boom. Most store experiences are revolting. Mm-hmm. Just terrible, particularly supermarkets, right? Right. The idea now is creatively, our creatives, instead of now just focusing on a 60-second, 30-second TV spot, boy, they should start with an idea, they should start with a consumer, and they should start in store. Because if we can turn that store into a theater of dreams, the, the biggest thing that Apple did was stop, selling in best, stop relying on Best Buy and Walmart and open their own store where the experience became an Apple experience. But how can you do that in a supermarket? <clears throat> sure you can. You can just take a fixture and you can, instead of, at the moment, it's all fixtured um, by product category instead of by consumer experience. When you're in the cold season, there are about 116 products that you need if, you're, if you think you're going to get a cold. Well, they're never merchandised together. Mm. In fact, it's just 87 cough, you know, medicines. Oh. So we're trying to bore the consumer into submission. <laughs> okay. Uh, is this, I'm going to switch gears here. Is this truth or, or is this legend that when you were the CEO of Pepsi-Cola Canada during a presentation, you actually had a Coke vending machine brought onto the stage and you took out a machine gun and you blasted away at it? And I hit it. 
and you hit it. <laughs> yeah, that's now, the I'm important ass- part of the story. <laughs> I'm assuming they were blanks, and I'm assuming that there was actually no one seriously hurt. And I'm assuming you did that as a business. You, you made a business decision when you did that. So I'm wondering what you're thinking Yeah, I wasn't was, just pissed, you know, trying to blast a blast Coke away vendor a Coke. out. Yeah. But, uh, but the other question related to that is, I know that, that that must have totally energized your audience, which yeah. included employees, and it must have energized you. How do you keep up that that pumped up energy that you need for the kind of job that you have. We'll start with the truth behind the story, right? right? The true. story, uh, it's, it's, it's true. It was, I was the CEO of Canada and we were number two to Coke and we'd been number two to Coke for 105 years. And we were, by Nielsen share indices, about 0.5 of a point behind them that period. And I figured if we could take our guys over the edge, we could get leadership. The time it was a no, uh, the NAFTA agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was the big, big kind of thing. And the Canadians were very frightened of it because they thought they would be swallowed by uh, America because America have scale and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And a guy called Brian Mulrooney at the time was the Prime Minister of Canada. And uh, Mulrooney had asked me to speak at some pro, because he was very pro free trade, and I was very pro free trade, would I speak at this big black tie dinner in Toronto? And I said, yes, I would. So we had the TV cameras there because because Mulroney was there and because he was giving a speech in support of free trade. And I was opening the thing from, from the role of business, okay? So I brought in a load of our big retail customers, all of whom were very worried about free trade because they thought that Walmart were going to swamp Loblaws and so on. Plus we had a load of, so a load of our customers there and a load of key Pepsi people there, a bunch of them. And I made the point in my speech, okay, that competition was the way to go and that in this kind of free trade battle, Canada would become stronger because we were fast, we were flexible, we could move quicker, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And that we would be made better by the American competitors. They would lift our game, et cetera, et cetera. And I talked about how Pepsi in Canada was a company driven by all local bottlers Mm -hmm. and no local entrepreneurs, whereas Coke was owned by the US company. And I said, so here we are, right? And here's what's gonna happen to us. And we're gonna go with all my Canadian Vancouver bottlers and Quebecois bottlers. We're gonna go past them, man, I'm telling you. And at that time I opened the the theater curtains and brought on a big Coca-Cola vending machine, bent down, put on a safety goggles, picked up a machine gun, and blew the thing into pieces. Everybody hit the deck. They were, you know, ball gowns going all over the places, handbags going. We'd, of course, told the Royal Canadian Mounted Police so they didn't yes. shoot me because I was <laughs> kind of nervous that somebody was going to pull a... Ch- I would never have done it in Detroit or anything like that. So, And, yes, it was blanks. What it was, I had all the vending machine lit up electronically, so all I had to do was to hit it with a rubber I bullet and the explosives inside. Oh. Of course, what happened for the next three weeks... The whole media was all over this thing. It was shot across every piece of television, and it was always with the line, here's Pepsi going to go past Coke, blowing this. Every sales call my guys meant start, started off with, y- y- you work for that crazy guy who shot up the machine, instant, it's fantastic. Boof, it was and we went past them, right? right? So, that it month. so it was just that momentum yeah. theater to tip up over the edge. And I think, how do you keep yourself going? I mean, I'm, if you're in a creative industry, I'm in the ideas business, right? You know, we live in the age of the idea. Wharton's in the ideas business, right? You're in the innovation business. Without that, you die. I'm in the same business. It's pretty exciting, you know? I'm not into process or routine or bureaucracy or what went before. It's all about getting to the future first. Um, so if you can't get excited, you know, I'm surrounded by 5,000 creative people and you can never get those eagles to fly in formation, so you better enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You've, you, I also read that that one of that your favorite job on the way up to the top or up, on the way up to the current job you have now was as a brand manager for P&G in the 1970s. What was so special about that? Learning. You know, I was kicked out of school when I was 17, so I wasn't able to do an MBA at Wharton. So at the age of 25, I realized that my peers were simply smarter than me. I was faster, tougher, more aggressive, whatever else, but they were smarter. And in the end, I thought, you know what? You, you, can't, you can have as much EQ as you want, but if you've got an IQ gap, it's not going to be very helpful. I better fill that gap. 
And uh, at the time, I was working for the Gillette company, and P&G never, ever hired from other companies. And I persuaded them that with me, because I was still only 25, they should make an exception. So they started me at, oh, they punished me, obviously, being Proctor, right, as the lowest assistant on the on, on the totem pole. And uh, I learned there for seven or eight years. I must have learned 30 things a day. And everything I now know about marketing pretty much was founded then. Right. And when you went to when you went to Saatchi and Saatchi in 1997, uh, I understand you were brought in to kind of revive was somewhat of a flagging company, bad morale, etc. And you were expected to bring in a whole team of people, but you made a conscious decision not to let any of the old team go for two years. Now that's kind of counterintuitive to what we hear when they bring in new CEOs. They they, they rush in to bring their new team. They get rid of all the dead word that they perceive is there. Why did you make that decision? And did it work? Um, I'd never worked in advertising before, so I didn't really know much about advertising. So I thought it would be kind of better if I <laughs> if I worked <laughs> with the people around. that did know about advertising because I really didn't know anything about it. I had no idea how an advertising agency worked because I'd only worked on the other side. I also think zigging when others zag is, is kind of where I'd like to start. So the very fact that everybody did it the other way around made me think, well, that usually doesn't work, so let me have a, another think about it. And then I met the people in the first three days, and I thought, you know, they're okay. All that you're suffering from is a leadership vacuum. You don't have a purpose. You don't have a dream. You don't have a framework. You've been let down by the, the two Saatchi brothers who led the company in, in typical style from a great entrepreneurial company to the biggest in the world and couldn't keep up. So then it you know, collapsed financially, not, not through functionally. Everybody's morale was battered and heaved. But from a capability point of view, I thought they were all still top talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked. I mean, we've it grown. Yeah. Right, you know, our business 11 years out of 11 revenue, 11 years out of 11 margin, top three in the world creatively, and got rid of the $2 billion debt and didn't um, go into bankruptcy, which is where we were heading. Right. What's the best ad campaign you've ever seen? Uh, the best ad campaign I've ever seen? Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on ad campaigns, to say the truth. I think it was for Castlemaine Forex, a beer that you would never have heard of um, in, in Australia. And so the brand was Forex. It's like Dos Equis in, mm -hmm. in Mexico. Right. So we had four because everything in Australia is bigger. It's a bit like Texas. So we had four. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the campaign was run to launch the Aussie lager in the UK. And the campaign line was Aussies don't give a X, X, X <laughs> for any other lager, right? <laughs> right? And every execution was around that, you know, and uh, it was it was it was absolutely, absolutely dynamic. Yeah. One final question. You were born in, in England. You live in Tribeca, but actually your family and your, your wife and children are in New Zealand where your home is. Why New Zealand? Uh, I went there in 1989, headhunted to run the, the, what was then the biggest company in New Zealand. Two companies merged together, Lion, a big brewer, soft drink manufacturer, and Nathan, a big retailer that had the equivalent of Target and Woolworths and all those franchises. They put these two companies together and had no idea how to run them or what to do with them once they would come together. They wanted someone with international experience because they knew the future was outside of New Zealand because mm -hmm. we only have 4 million people. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are 25 million sheep there, so we can move forward on that, which would be good if they had purchasing power, but they don't. So, so there's 4 million uh, people and the businesses had nothing to do with each other at all, right? So we had to strategically decide how to go offshore, what businesses to keep, which businesses to sell. And they wanted a someone from outside of both companies, mm -hmm. right, to sit on top of it. Again, and not a, not a typical solution. Mm -hmm. Typically, one guy would have won and one guy would have lost. So I sat just on the top. And they wanted someone who was not an American because they felt that Americans in New Zealand would probably not necessarily understand. I'd been working in Canada. I was born in England, and they found that culture closer to New Zealand. But you could have settled your family in any country. I mean, you've probably been to, what, 90 countries in the world? You could have settled in any one. Have you been to New Zealand? No. Well, that would answer that would the answer question. It. Yeah, it's, it's paradise. Beautiful. So I became a New Zealander in, within two years. It's a value-driven society, a value driven on egalitarianism, on social equality, on environmental issues, mm -hmm. and on great education for all. So I'm from working-class England. It was like being transplanted into a place that the 
southern upper class hadn't ruined. Oh, great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.